So if we switch to women, what do women want? They want also physical appearance for short-term mating, yeah, phys physical attractiveness. What else? Uh, well, some uh, cues that represent physical attractiveness that maybe represent health. Well, well here's this is your. It's, I'm learning a lot here. Yeah. Well, so but you're you're also asking a very interesting question about uh, what is uh, controversial within the evolutionary psychology um, field, right? Right, and not totally resolved. So that's why you're on the sixth edition of the book, and there, there could be a lot more editions <laughs> yeah, coming. Yeah, I revise it every four years or so because there's four years of um, new, interesting work, and so it deserves updating. But the traditional, I should say, uh, uh, answer to your question is that women go for good genes, cues to good genes in the short term, and cues to resources in the long term. And this has been a hypothesis that advocated, not, I didn't come up with this this one, um, by uh, Steve Gangestad, a former student of mine, Marty Hazleton, Randy Thornhill, and some other um, very smart players in the field. And, um, and what they used as uh, markers of good genes are things like symmetrical features uh, and masculine features. So strong jawline, high shoulder to hip ratio, um, you know, uh, other, other sorts of masculine features. But I started to doubt this explanation for what women want in the short term um, because of some other findings. So for, for women, a lot of short-term mating is not one night stand mating, so, but rather it's uh, a fair mating. So, uh, so if you ask the question, why do women have affairs? So let's restrict the question for the moment. My colleagues would argue, well, women have affairs because they're trying to get good genes from one guy while in, they're getting investment from the regular partner, mm -hmm. the, the husband. Okay, but the problem is that when women have affairs, uh, 70 plus percent tend to fall in love with or become attached to their affair partner. Now, uh, sorry, what percentage? Seventy? Uh, yeah, seventy. Some large majority. Yeah, seventy wow. percent or, or, or more. In contrast to men, where it's more like thirty percent of men who have affairs fall in love with or become attached to their affair partner. So, but from a design perspective, um, an engineering perspective, if you will. Uh, that's a disastrous thing if you're just trying to get good genes. So you're trying to retain the investment of one guy yeah. while getting good genes surreptitiously from this, you know, guy who presumably has more. Falling in love with him, becoming attached, that's that's not a feature you want. Yeah, it's bad engineering. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's bad engineering. And so and so I developed a, a, an alternative uh, hypothesis that I call the mate switching hypothesis, which is that... Um, Affairs are one way in which women um, divest themselves of a, uh, a cost-inflicting partner or a partner who uh, things aren't working out well with, and it's a way to either transition back into the mating market or to or to trade up in in the mating market. Uh, and and so and anyway, so these are these are probably the two leading hypotheses about why why women have affairs, and I. I'm putting my money on the mate switching hypothesis. Um, my uh, esteemed colleagues are putting their money on the good genes hypothesis, but I think the evidence for the good genes hypothesis is starting to um, look shakier than initially. Uh, well, this is a heated proposed. debate. I mean, mate switching sounds like a, so, so from a game theory perspective, from an engineering perspective, it seems to make a lot more sense, unless you put a lot of value in lifelong, sort of in the long-term mating, uh, some kind of value in the um, lifelong singular relationship, like monogamy. Yeah. Uh, and maybe we do, psychologically. Maybe there's a big evolutionary advantage to that. And we, we do, but we also know that divorce is, you know, um, and breakups are, are also common and occur in all cultures. So yeah. um, that's... But we're just not very good at this thing. Well, either we're not good at the mate selection, such that that uh, maybe we're we're not incorporating uh, all the variables well, or 
or just not good at monogamy, period, from an evolutionary perspective? Well, I think there, <laughs> that's... <laughs> raises, Another debate? No, that raises an interesting set of questions. So I think that, I mean, one issue is is longevity. So, I mean, we didn't live to be 70, 80 uh, years old in over 99% of human evolutionary history. And so we didn't necessarily evolve to be mated monogamously with one person for decades and decades and decades. Uh, but I also think that um, long-term pair bonding is a critical strategy, but mate switching is also a critical strategy. So if you have a mate, for example, who um, uh, becomes cost-inflicting or becomes uh, sufficiently debilitated or who... Um, suffers uh, an injury such that like in hunter-gatherer societies where the mate can no longer hunt, can no longer provide resources for their kids and, and, and the woman, this becomes, this becomes a problem. And so, uh, and so I think that we have adaptations to mate switch and to divest ourselves from some partners and trade up in the mating market under certain conditions. So, okay. And those conditions will differ for men and women. What are some of the cues in terms of what women want? Um, you know, I go to the gym. It's a, a, a hotly contested debate. You said evolutionary psychology, and this is uh, in the uh, bro psychology forums that I visit uh, multiple times a day. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, what What's the most important cue of appearance for guys? Um, what muscle group is the most important to work on? Do, do well, women care about biceps is what I'm asking. In terms of physical appearance, um, uh, a, a good um, a shoulder to hip ratio, so relatively wide shoulders relative to hips um, is, is one. Women tend to prefer men who are uh, physically fit and well-toned, but not muscle bound so like if you go to oh, i don't know some like those early uh when arnold schwarzenegger was doing the miss mr whatever it was contest mm -hmm. you see the women don't find those attractive the, the extremely muscle bound guys but they like uh a guy who's physically fit high shoulder to hip ratio uh, they like guys who are physically taller than they are, mm -hmm. um, and guys who are a bit above average in in height. So, if the average, so if uh, you know the average is I don't know five nine, five ten, and out there for humans, depending on the culture, women prefer a, an inch or two taller than that. Um, so, um, so shoulders, height, dad bod. What, what, what's that about? Why don't why why do you want a dad bod? Why why do you what, what, uh, why why not? How do I define dad what, bod? What is a dad bod? Dad bod is not muscle bound. Okay, so out a, of shape. A little no, no 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 just a little bit, uh -huh. a little bit of uh, a cushion for the pushing. I don't know what the kids <laughs> call it these days, uh, but just a little bit, a little bit of, uh, of fat. So what's why do do they not want uh, guys to be obsessed with their body? Is that or is that some evolutionary thing? Yeah, I think that um, women might interpret a guy who is so obsessed with his body that he's uh, they might view that as a sign of nar narcissism. Yes, um, and that's not a good trait. <laughs> uh, what about like cultures where? large sort of overweight men are valued is that how do you explain like how much can we override the evolutionary desires with our sort of cultural f fashions of the day that maybe represent other desirable aspects like wealth well wealth is uh, resources have always been important um especially to women so is a man able to acquire resources and is he willing to dispense them to her and her kids? So that's always important. In traditional cultures, that boils down to hunting skills. So if um, so, I asked a, a colleague, friend, Kim Hill, who's uh, probably the world's leading expert on the Ache of Paraguay, and uh, and you ask him, like, what, what leads to high status in the Ache in males? Hunting skills. That's, that's nice. the, the one thing the one thing the big variable and that's resources 
And, that, and that's resources. Now, yeah. what's what's interesting about modern culture is we have cash economies, <laughs> but cash economies are relatively recent. Um, and, you know, historically, there's over the vast uh, 99% of human evolutionary history, you weren't able to stockpile resources in the way that you mm -hmm. are today. Um, although there are in interestingly certain ways you can do it. So, so like you, you, you kill a large game animal, okay? You bring it back, you get some status points because you give some to your family, you, you can share it more widely with the group, et cetera. Um, but, um, but it's gonna go bad, right? You can't just say, I'm gonna keep this carcass around for the next several months, okay? But, and, and I think I think it's a Steve Pinker who might have used coined this phrase that they they store the meat in the bodies of other people. And so for example, they store it in their friends. So you know um, hunting success is uh, you know it's a, it's a hit or miss kind of thing. So you might come back empty-handed four times out of five, but and but when you do, you share your meat with others and then when, you know, and then they reciprocate by sharing their meat with you. And so and so you can store resources in the bodies of other people, which is I think an interesting way to think about it, but that can only go so far. And when you have cash economies, you have both the ability to stockpile resources, but also this kind of explosion in um, inequality of resources. And that's evolutionarily recent. What about, now this is the difference between the Huberman, the excellent Huberman Lab podcast that you did that people should listen to. He is a brilliant scientist, a um, sort of uh, a, a rigorous analyst of what is true in the scientific community, also helps you with great advice on how to live. Now in contrast to that, I am a, um, a terrible, uh, <laughs> uh, almost idiotic level journalist. So this is what you have to deal with. Another thing that people talk about that women care about is penis size. Does penis size matter for women in sexual selection? Well, um, there's controversy about that. In the uh, evolution of psychology community? Well, I, is there not, papers on penis size? I wouldn't say uh, scientific paper, so speculations uh, sure. uh, about so not and, in nature or, or in science. Yeah, yeah, no, nothing, nothing that I've seen there. Um, you know, I, I think that there's individual variability. Um, so uh, this is something that comes up again. You know, when I ask women in the class, my classes, you know, what do women want? Some of them will say, you know, a large penis. Uh, but I think there's variability um, in in that preference and it also might depend in part on the variability in the woman's anatomy so um but do you think there's something fundamental in terms of evolutionary psychology in terms of evolution or is this a quirk of culture that's current that's maybe somehow connected to pornography or something like that yeah my my guess is it's it's something that's uh perhaps a quirk of culture or or something that is evolutionarily recent Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, but, but I don't know. I mean, it's, it's a topic that hasn't been explored much. I've never done work on it. And well, somebody uh, should do a PhD, uh, sort of some archeologist should do a PhD on the history of human civilization and, and its, uh, valuation of penis size and, and the correlation of penis size to the value of the male. Okay. Moving on. Another absurd question to, in terms of what men want. Again, definitely not a Huberman Lab podcast question. <laughs> Why do men, let's say a large fraction of men, love boobs? Well, uh, I, I think that... Uh, You're one of the it, uh, most cited evolutionary psychologists, and this is what you signed up for, this, this, these <laughs> kinds of questions. Questions like this, yeah, yeah. Well, so again, this is something I haven't studied directly, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, scientifically, <laughs> yes, is. yes. Uh, but um, but yeah, there's been some work on that, and and it's uh, another cultural quirk, perhaps. Uh, no, I don't think it's a cultural quirk because I think it's the uh, the shape that matters a lot because shape is going to be a, a, a cue to fertility, uh, and so one of the things that humans are attracted to in the opposite sex is sexually dimorphic features and breasts are 
a sexually dimorphic feature. What's and, dimorphic mean? Uh, difference between difference in morphology between males and females. Got it. Um, di meaning to morphic morphology. Uh, so, um, and, and women don't develop uh, breasts until um, puberty or po post puberty. Uh, and and so, uh, as a sexually dimorphic characteristic, we tend to be attracted to that. Same is true, with, by the way, with the waist to hip ratio that we mentioned earlier. Uh, prior to puberty, males and females have very similar waist to hip ratios, but at puberty, um, there's a differential uh, hip development and fat deposition that creates a sexual dimorphism uh, with respect to waist hip ratio. And so, again, that's men are attracted to this waist to pressure that no man consciously says that they find this woman attra more attractive than that right. woman they don't think ah she has a waist hip ratio of 0.70 that's, that's right. exactly what i do but they, uh, <laughs> most men most men yes yes uh <laughs> so isn't that fascinating that we just build these entire industries of fashion and what we find beautiful around these kinds of ideas and we just and then not just not just fashion, and then we build uh, we have, uh sociological tensions about whether we should care about this kind of thing or not. There's there's battles in that space. It's it's like they seem so simple. It's just the human body, and we wear clothes. First of all, that's that's a funny thing. What what's the why are we wearing clothes? What's the shame aspect? Yeah. of covering up the body. Is that another feature, or is that what is that? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's an interesting question, and I, I don't know. It's just like hiding uh, ovulation. Maybe that's another hiding. Like uh, maybe hiding is a great game theoretic thing to play with because it can give you it can give the powerless more power. By covering, well, well, maybe. well. I think there are a few things. So one is the sort of arbitrary features of fashion, and then the other is the aspects of fashion that attempt to um, magnify our what is inherent in our evolved standards of beauty. Okay. So, for example, um, women tend to wear things that accentuate their waist hip ratio. Um, uh, so, I mean, historically, those um, in the old days, corsets, for example, cinch the woman's uh, waist, um, uh, and you wouldn't see fashion develop in a way that made a woman seem um, old, unhealthy, um, uh, pockmarked, uh, signs of open sores or lesion or right? there, there are certain domains um, design spaces that you wouldn't that, that no culture would develop um so but there are arbitrary features but sometimes they're not entirely arbitrary or they're arbitrary at one level of description but not at another so for example fashion tends to be linked with status and that's why it constantly changes it's the high status people start wearing a certain type of clothing uh, and then when the lower status people imitate them then they have to shift to signal their status and so i think the fashion and clothing is in part linked to status 